The increased reliance on digital tools in patient care has elevated the importance of digital inclusion for promoting health equity in the United States. The recently passed Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, although not focused on health care, could present opportunities to advance digital inclusion. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Jorge Rodriguez, a hospitalist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Rodriguez has co-authored a perspective article about the infrastructure law and why digital inclusion is a health care issue. Dr. Rodriguez, could you start by explaining why digital inclusion is important? How do digital redlining and other policies and practices hinder access to health tools in marginalized communities? I think the main point here with digital inclusion is that increasingly we're seeing healthcare systems become quote unquote digital first. And along with that, I don't think there's been as much of a focus on being digitally inclusive first. And I think that as we've seen throughout the pandemic with the rise of telehealth and patient portals playing an increasing role, we've seen these significant gaps develop in which marginalized populations don't have use or access to these tools. And it really goes back to the communities that they're part of, the broadband infrastructure that they live in, the affordability of the internet, the affordability of devices, their ability to interact with all these tools, all the components that we think about with digital inclusion really drive at the fact that if we're really going to commit to being a quote unquote digital first healthcare system, we really have to right along that same path, be digitally inclusive first or else we're just going to extend the disparities that already exist in so many other places in the healthcare system. What steps have individual health systems taken to try to address some of these barriers, and how successful have they been? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there's been a lot of energy and a lot of focus to say, we acknowledge the fact that we have left some populations behind in the way we deliver digital healthcare. And A lot of the focus has been on addressing those same issues. So for the broadband access component, there's been some health organizations that have tried to offer patients, like we're going to pay for your broadband access, or for others, here's a device with internet access, or here's a digital health navigator or a person that's going to help you use this tool has been a lot of the focus. I think that the broader concern when we zoom out is that's very siloed. It's very like healthcare centric. And we realize that some of these interventions may not be sustainable or may not be equitable to certain, for example, smaller clinics that may not have the funding to say, I'm going to start giving everyone a device and internet access and really forces us to zoom out and say, okay, this is clearly a community issue. This is clearly a component of the way we deliver care across the community. And what can we do to better address that? My sense is that interventions like that, that are very healthcare focused, are just not going to be a sustainable way to ensure digital inclusion. You write in your perspective article that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act takes away much of the responsibility for building digital infrastructure from these individual healthcare organizations and makes digital inclusion a public concern. So what components of the law are relevant to the healthcare sector? There's a whole area around digital equity, and the main focus of it is a $65 billion for digital inclusion initiatives. There's about $42.5 billion, which specifically invest in actually like broadband infrastructure, so the laying down of wire or satellite, whatever it is, to actually build out internet access in communities that may lack it. And then it has $14.2 billion to focus on affordability. So now that you may have internet set up in a community, can patients actually afford it? And it uses those funds to create a $30 a month subsidy term, the Affordable Connectivity Program which also includes $100 towards a device, which is nice. And then interestingly, it also includes $2.8 billion towards the creation of digital literacy programs. So it seems to show a real good understanding of the challenges that healthcare systems and patients are facing in bridging that gap between we have telehealth and like getting it out to patients. So I think those are the kind of key funding pieces. And then the last point I'll mention, which was very kind of progressive for me to see and exciting to see, was it actually encourages the FCC to look at digital discrimination or digital redlining in the way internet service providers are actually deploying and developing some of these internet services in marginalized communities to make sure they're not either not offering enough speed in certain areas or offering very high cost in certain areas. So I think it takes a multi-pronged approach, which I think is a really nice way for healthcare systems to now be able to be more active participants and also be able to deploy that kind of digital first dream to some extent. Looking at digital literacy, you talk in your article about the role of healthcare organizations in partnering with community-based programs can have to encourage digital literacy. What could those kinds of collaborations look like? 
I think it really comes down to looking at the healthcare organization as like one touch point or one player in this larger spectrum of digital literacy. If you think about digital literacy, it really sort of goes to the point of being able to interact meaningfully with whatever device or computer technology is in front of you. And that not only affects your health, but also affects education, workforce development, your civic engagement. And so I think some of the things that I imagine working well would be I've now engaged a patient or talked to a patient about the fact that they had trouble using a video visit, for example. I've been able to support them to view a video visit and now got them interested in technology as, as a part of their life. Can I now refer them to a local class for English learners who's also doing workforce development and teaching people how to use Microsoft Office to help them apply for jobs, help them sign up for to vote? Can I now help them apply for schooling that they may need? So those kind of things where there's a lot of great community organizations that have been doing this for such a long time, and it really helps us promote the fact that like the healthcare system doesn't have to reinvent this. They can go out to the local libraries, the community organizations to make those connections. I really view it as sort of like a touch point to get folks interested in. This can also be useful for your health, but also for other areas. And can you then say, I'm going to now refer you to this community organization that sort of knows the digital literacy space even better and can impact these broader aspects of your life, which in the end, as we all know, and we think about this context of social determinants of health, then feed back into the patient's overall health. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there that this bill lays the foundation for. You say in your article that healthcare organizations will need to address additional barriers that aren't covered in this new law in order to create an inclusive system. So what steps do you envision them taking? I think the other components here are, one is, I think there's a big opportunity from like a data perspective. One, there's, we sort of know that a lot of the current data around internet access is limited or not granular enough or just a little bit unreliable. So I think there's an opportunity for healthcare organizations to, as a lot of healthcare organizations are gathering that data, they're asking patients, do you have device? Do you have internet? Can you use it? So that's really powerful data that you can then bring back to policymakers and folks that are administering a lot of the funding that comes with it to say, here's the data that we have as a health organization. Here are the gaps. Here are the communities that are really lacking affordable broadband. Here's where you should put your efforts. I think there's a component of kind of like data is power that I think that health organizations can bring to the table. The other component that connects with that is really about around the impact. A lot of this push kind of goes with some level of a sense that by providing patients better access to technology, we're going to improve their healthcare outcomes. But the only way to be able to look at that is for healthcare organizations to then go back similarly and say, okay, we undertook, you know, as a community, undertook this broadband funding act and we built out the broadband infrastructure in this area. And we were able to get up and running a diabetes remote monitoring program. And our diabetes outcomes got a lot better. Look at the impact that broadband had on this community. And being able to kind of feed that back to policymakers, I think will be another key component for healthcare systems to play. The other piece that I'd say doesn't address is really a lot of the platforms that healthcare relies on. So a lot of the telehealth platforms or a lot of the patient portals that patients see. So it doesn't really address those pieces. So I think healthcare systems going back to like EHR vendors, for example, encouraging them to build kind of culturally and linguistically tailored tools is another component with a healthcare system, even if you had the best infrastructure in place and the devices and the internet, there is some component where that there's some work to be done there. And then the last part I mentioned goes back to making sure that we're really addressing a lot of the existing disparities that we aim to address with a lot of the digital tools that we're implementing. Because so I think it's very important. And in the end, going back to patients and saying, is this the right tool for you? And making sure that we have multimodal components. I think back to an experience with two patients that we showed the patient portal to. One patient was like, wow, this is the best thing ever. I love this patient portal. And the other patient was like, I need an email for this. I don't really want an email. I'm perfectly living my life without email. And being able to be flexible in that way is the other piece of this that the infrastructure bill doesn't necessarily address. But I think it's important for healthcare systems to maintain that kind of multimodal components of care. Finally, if we imagine that this new law is a first step, What additional policy changes do you think will be needed to support digital inclusion? And how can physicians and healthcare organizations help ensure that policies most effectively address inequity in this area? I think there's a big component, especially in the telehealth space, around reimbursement and reimbursement across different types of modalities like video versus audio. 
as compared to in-person. So there's, there's that component to it. There's other components that a lot of other folks have talked about around interstate licensing laws and kind of simplifying those pieces to it. So I think those are important just from like making sure that the kind of reimbursement and licensing side of the world are addressed. But I think the biggest thing that healthcare systems can do are really be active participants, have a seat at the table in these discussions with the FCC, with internet service providers, with EHR vendors, and really coming together to say, we're taking this kind of digital inclusion as a key component as we're thinking about a digital first approach. And I think this infrastructure bill really encourages that to happen. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez.